Hello everyone, it's Dan King here from Fireside Strategic. We believe that there's a new way to lead and to grow businesses that combines razor sharp strategy and down to earth warmth and kindness. We call it human centric business growth. In the Fireside Chat series, we interview C-suite leaders and business owners who share this philosophy. Our goal is to uncover insights that can help other leaders grow their companies and to do it with humor, curiosity, and chutzpah. Today, really excited to be with Anis Kavanaugh, founder of the IEP Method and author of Contagious Culture and Contagious You. Anis, welcome to the show and would love to hear the, the quick, who are you and what do you do? Hi, Dan. Okay, well, thank you for having me. Uh, all right, so who I am, Anise, and what I do is I work with business leaders and organizations to help them create more impact in the world. And the way that we do it is by really working on the human being and their well-being and their leadership capacity and how they're showing up, and then also then looking at the organization and how it's supporting and creating a container for human beings to do more of that. Hmm. A container, a really interesting choice of words there. Not not a word that you typically hear. Um, how do we create that kind of container? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> we're, gonna go, we're jumping right in. Oh. Right in. <laughs> right in. Uh, so to me, the container, so a lot of times when people hear container, they think that it's you know constrictive and oh, you're gonna put me in a box. I don't think about it that way. I think about a container as the quality of the space that you create with another human being or a bunch of other human beings that allows them to really do their best work, feel safe, um, be healthy, and really be on purpose in the work that you guys are all doing together. And to me, the way that we create that is one in how all of us, so whether you're the CEO or you're a frontline employee, like how every single one of us shows up in it. And the IEP method that you mentioned at the very beginning, that stands for intentional energetic presence. And so what we look at in this work is, you know, how are people showing up? Like, what is their intention? Mm. What is the energy they're actually bringing to the table with their, in their organization, with their kids, with their team, like with their clients and how are they taking care of themselves to manage that energy? So it's two parts of the energy. Mm. And then their presence is how are they actually showing up? So what is their, you know, simple as simple as body language to the way they communicate to their yeah. presence with the other human being. And so to me, when we're all aware of that, because in this work, I found it's like 70% of it is awareness. Mm -hmm. That is what you actually do with it. But when we're all really aware of, okay, how am I showing up? What's my IEP? And we bring that together as an organization, the game gets a lot easier and the container to do our best work is a lot stronger and it grows. It becomes more and more. Expensive. Yeah. Yeah. There's something remarkable about taking an organization's almost signature. There's, there's each organization has unique DNA yeah. and the people in the organization set an intention to show up in a way that strengthens the best parts of that DNA. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a way to, for the brand to energetically appear in the world. And that has ripple effects. Yeah. Yeah. Big time, big time. The other piece is that if that container that we create with other people, it has a big impact on who we become mm. so as a leader in that organization. So, and even the brand that you're talking like, so I'll just speak from a leadership standpoint as a leader in an organization. Yeah. If you and I are working together and the size of the container I hold for you is like this big and I'm like, oh, I don't know if Dan can do this and I'm not really sure if I believe in him. And even if I'm not even saying that, but energetically I'm holding that with you. Yes. It's going to have an impact on how you show up, how you grow with me. You're going to feel that energy. And so the size of the container we hold for other human beings, it has an impact on who they can become and what they can grow into. And so it's another mm. thing to be really intentional about it. We so often hold beliefs, intentions, um, convictions that you're right, like this team member can't do X. And the hardest thing in the world to do is number one, to appreciate that you have that belief and even harder is to share it, right? Yeah. Um, and it kind of, the, the more aware you become, the more of an obligation you feel to share what you're feeling, right? And it creates, it's very challenging at first, but it imbues the container with honesty. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It does. It does. And then if that leader is doing their, um, 
and again, I'm just going to use myself because it's always easier just to bust myself <laughs> than anybody else. But if I, as a leader of my team, if I am noticing that I am holding a negative intention or yeah. a not really solid belief about an employee, it actually is my responsibility to do my own internal work around that first and to really get curious about it. Like, mm. what am I making? Where might this person be actually triggering something in me about myself? Mm. I really want to do my energetic hygiene before I go to that employee and say, hey, I want to talk about what's happening with you. Here are some yeah. concerns or awarenesses I have. Yeah. I am, I'm not sure. Do you think that, you know, like here's here's my, and, and if, I, if it's clean because I've actually done my work and so I'm not coming from a place of judgment and like all this, if it's clean, I can say that employee with a lot of love. Here's, here's something I'm aware of. Help me walk, like help walk me through this on why, why am I wrong? Or right. how can I be wrong? Or what support do you need? Or if I'm totally right and you're not feeling good about your job or you don't like this, let's figure out what else we do. I was I was working with somebody yesterday and he was all fired up because one of his employees came to him and said, oh my God, I'm so bored with my job. And he was really mad. And I said, oh, this is really interesting. Like you have a huge opportunity here your employee just came to you and felt safe enough to say i'm bored with my job i said underneath that is i want to be more challenged i want to be more seen and he went oh my gosh and the potential container he was going to hold for that employee was i can't believe an employee just told me they're bored but you know that's yeah. horrible yeah. when it, instead it opened up this beautiful next opportunity for him yeah. and his employee to do even bigger work together yeah and to set that intention of curiosity and I'm not going to react immediately at first blush to this supposed complaint, like it, that complaint can totally be viewed as an opportunity. Imagine if that employee didn't feel safe enough, if they felt bottled up and they weren't going to share that truth and they were sort of half-heartedly looking for another job, like that's not going to be good for anyone. No, it's not. And then, and then that, that just has like a ripple effect. I mean, that's just, you know, before we started recording, we we're talking about all the statistics that are getting released right now around like 40% are looking for a new job. Yesterday, there was a thing that said 95% of people are thinking about quitting. Like there's a huge opportunity here from a leadership standpoint that when your people mm -hmm. are feeling not engaged or you're feeling judgmental about them or, you, or they're saying they're bored or whatever, stop, pause before you react and get really curious about what's going on. Because if you can stay in that curiosity and really come from a place of love and service and also yes. hold people accountable, yeah. I, in my experience, there is magic on the other side of that. And that's where some of the strongest organizations get built. Yes. The, the breakdown happens just before the possibility. Um, yes. I am so curious to learn why you think it is like this statistic when you, you told me it before we started blew me away. I know. Sure, there's many reasons for it, but I'm so curious if we were to play around with, uh, initially from your perspective, why do you think it is that in this moment, 95% of people are asking that question? Well, if you if you look at the article, we can put the link to the article in the show notes and stuff for people too. Because I because I when I first saw that, I was like, this is fake news. <laughs> I was like, there's no way. But I went a little bit deeper, and and it and it, it and and it looks like it looks like it checks out. But what they cited. Mm -hmm was that, you know, I think it was around 51 or 55% were citing burnout um, as part of the reason why they wanted to leave. Um, others were talking about, they've just rethought their lives over the pandemic. Like when I, when I look at this and I look at all the work I'm doing with my clients right now, what I am noticing is there is a really beautiful, powerful, scary trend. And by scary, mm. I, it's scary to get in touch with this, I think for people. And then people think about losing their, or not losing, leaving their jobs. But there is a very powerful trend of people becoming more aware of their core values, mm. what's important to them, um, you know, how they actually want to work now in the world. You know, we've just been in lockdown, for lack of a better word, for the last 14 months in our rooms. You know, we've been sent to our, we've been in our rooms really <laughs> about, okay, what is my life? And where, where are my core values and what do I actually really want and what do I actually need and how do I actually want to work? And so I think people are really reassessing what's important. And then the other piece of that is the actual burnout. And there's been a complete lack of boundaries between, you know, people are working from home, you know, where does work start and work end and kids are running around in the background. And so like that blurry, the burnout is higher now than it was before the pandemic. And before the pandemic, we were even like, we had issues with burnout. So yeah. I think it's like a collective awakening and a lot of soul searching and 
I think the response I had to this was, okay, if you're feeling burnout, and, and I went through my vision this last year too, I have a ton of empathy around this, but it's like, if you're feeling burnout, how do you really make sure that you arm yourself with the tools, the self-care, the self-advocacy, mm -hmm. the ability to ask for what you want, the ability to say, I'm bored and I'm burnt out. Like, how do you arm yourself with that so that you take that with you? Because if you change industries or you change jobs or you change teams or you change marriages or relationships or whatever, everywhere we go, yeah. there we are. Yeah. So we have to really become more of our, more and more of our own best friends and get clear about our intentions, really take care of our energy and be even more present so that we're better armed for the future. You know, that phrase, I've never heard quite that phrase used before, self-advocacy, which I love. I'm going to steal that with or without your permission. I'm going to totally steal sure. that. No, please um, not, not invent that term. But please. I, it's yeah, absolutely. I it's, love it. It's very important. Yeah. Please. I have been chewing over recently. It's, it's interesting. Um, the more time you spend alone, particularly when you're used to being with people, so many emotions. So, so there's this period of reflection and, and these uncertainties that we have about our relationship to our work. And what's interesting is to do the same exercise when it comes to your feelings about other people mm -hmm. and all kinds of emotions just start to show up and we're required to enter into a more sophisticated relationship with those emotions and maybe be a little less reactive. So on the one hand, yeah, we're feeling like I don't want to spend time with this person anymore, or I don't want to spend time with this job anymore. But on the other hand, we're also compelled to say, well, where does that come from? What's going on? Is there something about me that I maybe could change a little bit yeah. because maybe I don't, love this reaction in myself. Do yeah. you follow? Yeah, I do follow. I think, I think it's, I think it's a really, um, I think it's a really powerful place that, that, that I think is a leadership skill to be able to look there. Yeah. yeah. You know, to, to be able to notice a trigger or to notice a judgment about anything about business or personal or whatever it might be. And to be able to go, okay, hold on, let me pause. Be gentle with myself because it's never about a make wrong or beating ourselves up. It's like, let me be gentle. Mm. With myself. Get really curious. Like what's going on with me? What is the resistance I'm experiencing with this person to your point, the relationship? Like what is the experience? Like what is, what is this resistance and where is that coming from? And, mm. you know, I know for me and, and when I work with people, what I often will notice if we can stop and get curious about that, we'll often find a place where we're, our alignment or our values are out of alignment. And so there's a values conflict. Okay. So then, so that's more information. So now I can go, can I honor my core values without making your values wrong? Yes. You yes. Can, yes. I, can we both agree? Like, and, and I think this is another thing that's happened this year with everything that's been going on in the world. It's like, there are a lot of values conflicts and we're finding that a lot of the values conflicts are with the people that we love most in the world. So, and our family members and spouses, like all that. And so, you know, we're no longer, we've no longer been able to run and run and get so busy out in the world. Yeah. Now kind of yeah. Like, okay. Here's really what it is. And um, can I honor my core values and really have space for that and stand strong in it mm. and also honor that you have yours, even if we completely disagree, can I still love you from that place and actually get curious and have a little bit of space for understanding that we're, that we're not aligned as opposed to trying to yeah. make my values on you, make your values yeah. wrong, get into some kind of a conflict around it. So I think yeah. that pause and getting really curious and then, um, Oh, so what I was going to say is like, so there's a values misalignment. There's also often in that space, a truth that is not being spoken. Mm -hmm. or a boundary that's mm -hmm. not been communicated or, you know, to your point about the complaint, there's a complaint that I have. If I stop and look at my complaint underneath yeah. my complaint is an uncommunicated yeah. request. Yeah. I can look at that request. I'm now more in a position of power. I can go, okay, here's how I want to try and shift the dynamic of this relationship right now, as opposed to completely, you know, kick it out of my life or whatever. Yes. 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 Ooh, so much richness to dig into there. <laughs> um, and when we're leading at work, these values conflicts, which are easier in other moments to brush aside than now, right? When we disrupt 
alignment in an organization when the agendas that are leading us to allocate our energies in different directions as a team, when all that comes up, ooh, we got to address it. But at least now, what a blessing to be able to address it yeah. and make an intentional decision about, well, does this mean some people move on from this organization? Yeah. Does this mean that a role transforms in an organization? Does this mean, in fact, that the whole mission of the organization needs to change and that everyone's out of alignment? Yeah. It's all on the table. Oh, it is. It's, and, my, and I hear you say my mouth waters. My mouth waters hearing you say that because this is a moment in time where people really get to take a step back. And if they're willing to do the work and have the courage to lean into that conversation, this is where a lot of amazing new missions, new organizations, new teams are going to get formed in this moment. Mm -hmm. So through it. You can't, you know, I, I hear you talk about, you know, we've got to have these conversations, put them on the table. The, I know so many people who think that they're having these conversations and put it on the table, but they're, they're doing them versus doing them. You know, they're, they're doing it. And they're, we're, we're talking about this, but they're not really talking about it. And so yeah. the question for anybody listening is, it's like, are you really being this conversation? Are you really getting into it and being comfortable with your discomfort around it? Because it's not necessarily a comfortable conversation. No. <laughs> you know, living, living <laughs> our values is like a, it's a radical act. Like being in alignment with core values is not always comfortable. And getting an organization together or a huge team of people, there's conflicting values all over there. So you kind of have to look at what, what, is, what is the core that we stand for? And maybe that has changed. And maybe that means people will move on. And maybe that's amazing. Yeah, yeah. Being as opposed to doing is a powerful distinction in it. I think for me, part of, and I've seen this with a lot of clients as well, that part of that transition is approaching these challenges from a more embodied place as opposed to a purely thinking kind of place. Because the challenges are so complex, you cannot think your way out of them. There's no way that your rational mind can compute all the variables involved. I don't care how high your IQ is. I don't care how many university degrees you have. Like, you know, there's this old phrase, if you're in your head, you're dead. And I, I think there's some truth to it because um, That's good. <laughs> there was, just as I, I heard you a second ago, um, talking about what's special about this moment, what an opportunity there is, I felt such a chill in my body pop up, such a, a sense of truth, right? And I think that's such valuable data. If you're in your head, you don't have access to it. Our embodied selves need to be contributors to these conversations. And so part of being a powerful participant in them is letting all of you into them. Yeah. Yeah. I, I completely agree. I um, I think, I mean, that's one of the things that we find in the IEP work is people will try and like, um, they go to their heads about it and they try and like analyze each of the components and the quadrants and the model and, that's great. It's those are frameworks to support you to kind of know where you're at in the model. And what we find over and over again is the answers are not up here. It is, it is being so connected actually to your body and your feelings. What we're talking about, Dan, is feelings. This conversation around this next moment, this conversation around what's happening with organizations, this is about the feelings and the humanity of the people that we're with. And so that that's not a head thing. The head can support with structures. That's great. The head can support with scheduling, but when it comes to the vision and the values and who are we now, that's, that's a heart thing. At the level of emotion and heart, one thought that's come up for me in the last couple of minutes, really curious what you think about this. Some people are going to say that creating this new working world of, and this new world, frankly, of radical authenticity in which each of us is no longer satisfied with 7.5. We want 10, right? We want a 10 level of alignment because at an embodied level, we're going to feel that something is off. We're going to feel that the 7.5 is off more than we used to, right? Mm -hmm. So, but I wonder whether maybe there's a fear that can we really create a world in which everyone can get to a 10 in which we're dissatisfied with a seven and a half? That's ambitious shit. It is ambitious shit. <laughs> it's ambitious shit. That that's it. That yeah, that's a t-shirt by the way. Ambitious shit. <laughs> um, I, I don't know. I hope so. I mean, I, I I like to set my intention and 
the field of possibility that that's possible. I don't know if I see it in my lifetime, but I think that if we're here, here, here's how I feel about that. Can we create that world? I don't know. I sure would love to think that. Um, is that idealistic or naive? Maybe. Uh, do Am I devoted to making sure that I'm doing everything I can personally to bring that to the world and then also support anybody I'm responsible with, my team, the people that I lead, the people I work with? Am I devoted to adding and contributing to that as much as possible in every moment? Absolutely. And the thing that gives me peace, because if I think about let's create it for the whole world, I, I actually, even hearing that, I get a little tired. <laughs> like, oh my God, that's a lot. However, if I think about, let me create that in my way of being as I go throughout my day as much as possible. Mm. Some days are going to be hard. Some days are going to be hard and some days are going to be like, forget it. I'm not even I, like, I'm at a five and I'm fine. You know, that's great. That's, that's part of authenticity, right? Yeah. I can hold that every day, if I'm present to myself, my intention is to show up as authentically as possible to come from a place of love to continue to focus on impact, the things that we're talking about. If, if I personally can live that, I can control that for myself. Yeah. And then I can trust that that will be contagious, you know, hence contagious, yes. contagious you, that will yes. be contagious in a good way, not contagious COVID, um, that uh -huh. will be contagious in a way that makes a dent. And then those people go and make a dent. And then those people go and make a dent. And so therefore, it, then, then it doesn't become so grandiose that people just go, yeah. oh, that's not possible. And then they shut it down. Yes. Yes. So. Love it. What a beautiful, beautiful answer. And in, and as we come towards the end of our, our time together, curious to learn just a little bit more about how you are doing that. And so you were telling me before the interview about IEP 103, yeah. a new form that your work has taken. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for asking. I am. Um, so, I, you know, up until this point in time, I've been, you know, I've been leading this work for 20, almost 20 years now. And um, it's, you know, it's constantly growing. And a lot of the ways that we've done it is, you know, I'll go and I'll work with executive teams and we'll, we'll put them in leadership cohorts and I'll do really deep work with them. And then what happens is they shift their game, they shift this conversation and then it gets rippled into their employees and then like that. What we found, especially over the pandemic, was we needed a different way to do that. So more people could access this work at lower price points, more self-paced, you know, not time bound, and also to be able to do it, do it with their team. So we needed um, IEP 103, which is our self-study program. And basically people can get it now. I'm, I'm super excited about this because this was, I think I told you this was our vision for 2023 and COVID forced it for 2021. So I'm really grateful for that, but we have it now so people can learn the core components of the IEP method in 103 minutes. And then we've built in additional bonus material so they can go in a lot of different directions. And the trend that we're starting to see is people will order it for themselves and then they'll mm -hmm. actually order it for their team. And they're now doing it as a team. So they're individually getting the support from an IEP standpoint, like what are my core values and how am I showing up and all this stuff. But they're also supporting it then in the organization because the organization has created a space for this <clears> conversation. <throat> and so, you know, as I mentioned, it's, it's new. We just released it uh, a little over a month ago. We're starting to get feedback now. It's it's I'm I'm happy about what's happening, and I think it's the next. It's one of the next ways for people to access this work and do it either individually or to really do it with their organization. Very cool. And is there a website people can go to if they want to take a look? Yeah, absolutely. If you go to anisekavanaugh.com, uh, there's a ton of information. There are articles and posts, and like a lot of that. The programs are also on there, and if you go to iep.io that will give you access to some tools that we just put out there for free um, like the iep sheet which helps you kind of get your mind right before going into a conversation or into a meeting um and that'll get you onto my quote unquote list so that we can be in communication with you and, and we don't we never spam we just will send out articles and announcements and stuff so it's a good way to stay in touch fantastic and and a note that we always love to end on a, a human note, which would make sense for this show. When you're not doing this powerful work in the world, what do you do for fun? What do you do to relax? Oh, I have a <laughs> pandemic puppy <laughs> named Booker, uh, who is nine months old now, who's a golden doodle, who is, he looks like Snuffleupagus from um, Sesame Street, not to date myself, but it, this dog is 100% pure oxytocin. So I have him and then I have a rescue mm. about 14 years old. 
Um, we spend some good time together. And then I've got, I've got kids, I've got a 21 year old and a 16 year old who I adore. And, and then, I, and then I love to, I love to get outside and exercise and all that good stuff. So it's pretty simple, but it's gorgeous. Very meaningful. Simple is so often awesome. Um, I love simple. Speaking of which, this interview was not simple, but certainly was awesome. Pleasure to have you. So proud to support the work you're doing in the world. So absolutely essential in this moment and really just encourage people to take a look at the awesomeness Anise is up to. Thank you. So, thank you so much, Dan. Thank you for this conversation. I um, I love this conversation and I think I think you and I could have talked for hours about this. There's, there's mm -hmm. so much depth to it. Mm -hmm. thank, thank you for the work you're doing in the world and for and for giving people the space to have this conversation with you. It's big. Well, it's my pleasure. Speak